The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 2. Beginning Life as a Printer. From a child I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands was ever laid out in books. Pleased with the Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's works in separate little volumes. I afterward sold them to enable me to buy R. Burton's historical collections. They were small Chapman's books, and cheap, forty or fifty in all. My father's little library consisted chiefly of books in polemic divinity, most of which I read, and have since often regretted that, at a time when I had such a thirst for knowledge, more proper books had not fallen in my way, since it was now resolved I should not be a clergyman. Plutarch's Lives there was in which I read abundantly, and I still think that time spent to great advantage. There was also a book of Defoe's called An Essay on Projects, and another of Dr. Mather's called Essays to Do Good, which perhaps gave me a turn of thinking that had an influence on some of the principal future events of my life. This bookish inclination at length determined my father to make me a printer, though he had already one son, James, of that profession. In 1717 my brother James returned from England with a press and letters to set up his business in Boston. I liked it much better than that of my father, but still had a hankering for the sea. To prevent the apprehended effect of such an inclination, my father was impatient to have me bound to my brother. I stood out some time, but at last was persuaded, and signed the indentures when I was yet but twelve years old. I was to serve as an apprentice till I was twenty-one years of age only I was to be allowed journeyman's wages during the last year. In a little time I made great proficiency in the business, and became a useful hand to my brother. I now had access to better books, and acquaintance with the apprentice of booksellers enabled me sometimes to borrow a small one, which I was careful to return soon and clean. Often I sat up in my room reading the greatest part of the night, when the book was borrowed in the evening, and to be returned early in the morning, lest it should be missed or wanted. After some time an ingenious tradesman, Mr. Matthew Adams, who had a pretty collection of books, and who frequented our printing-house, took notice of me, invited me to his library, and very kindly lent me such books as I chose to read. I now took a fancy to poetry, and made some little pieces, my brother, thinking it might turn to account, encouraged me, and put me on composing occasional ballads. One was called The Lighthouse Tragedy, and contained an account of the drowning of Captain Worthylake, with his two daughters. The other was a sailor's song on the taking of Teach, or Blackbeard, the pirate. They were wretched stuff in the Grub Street ballad style, and when they were printed he sent me out to the town to sell them. The first sold wonderfully, the event being recent, having made a great noise. This flattered my vanity, but my father discouraged me by ridiculing my performances, and telling me verse-makers were generally beggars. So I escaped being a poet, most probably a very bad one, but as prose-writing had been of great use to me in the course of my life, and was a principal means of my advancement, I shall now tell you how in such a situation I acquired what little ability I have in that way. There was another bookish lad in the town, John Collins by name, with whom I was intimately acquainted. We sometimes disputed, and very fond we were of argument, and very desirous of confuting one another, with disputatious turn, by the way is apt to become a very bad habit making people often extremely disagreeable in company, by the contradiction that is necessary to bring it into practice, and thence, besides souring and spoiling the conversation, is productive of disgusts and, perhaps, enmities where you may have occasion for friendship. 
I had caught it by reading my father's books of dispute about religion. Persons of good sense, I have since observed, seldom fall into it, except lawyers, university men, and men of all sorts that have been bred at Edinburgh. A question was once, somehow or other, started between Collins and me, of the propriety of educating the female sex in learning, and their abilities for study. He was of the opinion that it was improper, and that they were naturally unequal to it. I took the contrary side, perhaps a little for the dispute's sake. He was naturally more eloquent, and had already plenty of words, and sometimes, as I thought, bore me down more by his fluency than by the strength of his reasons. As we parted without settling the point, and were not to see one another again for some time, I sat down to put my arguments in writing, which I copied fair and sent to him. He answered, and I replied. Three or four letters of a side had passed when my father happened to find my papers and read them. Without entering into the discussion, he took occasion to talk to me about the manner of my writing, observed that, though I had the advantage of my antagonist in correct spelling and pointing, which I owed to the printing-house, I fell far short in elegance of expression, in method, and in persecuity, of which he convinced me by several instances. I saw the justice of his remarks, and hence grew more attentive to the manner in writing, and determined to endeavour at improvement. About this time I met with an odd volume of The Spectator. It was the third I had never before seen any of them. I bought it, read it over and over, and was much delighted with it. I thought the writing excellent, and wished, if possible, to imitate it. With this view I took some of the papers, and making short hints of the sentiment in each sentence, laid them by a few days, and then, without looking at the book, tried to complete the papers again by expressing each hinted sentiment at length, and as fully as it had been expressed before, in any subtle words which should come to hand. Then I compared my spectator with the original, discovered some of my faults, and corrected them. But I found I wanted a stock of words, or a readiness in recollecting and using them, which I thought I should have acquired before that time, if I had gone on making verses, since the continual occasion for words of the same import, but of different length, to suit the measure, or of different sound, for the rhyme, would have laid me under a constant necessity of searching for variety, and also have tended to fix that variety in my mind, and make me master of it. Therefore I took some of the tales and turned them into verse, and after a time, when I had pretty well forgotten the prose, turned them back again. I also sometimes jumbled my collections of hints into confusion, and after some weeks endeavoured to reduce them into the best order, before I began to form the full sentences and complete the paper. This was to teach me method in the arrangement of thoughts. By comparing my work afterwards with the original, I discovered many faults and amended them but I sometimes had the pleasure of fancying that, in certain particulars of small import, I had been lucky enough to improve the method of the language, and this encouraged me to think I might possibly in time come to be a tolerable English writer, of which I was extremely ambitious. My time for these exercises and for reading was at night, after work, or before it began, in the morning, or on Sundays, when I contrived to be in the printing-house alone, evading as much as I could the common attendance on pulpit worship, which my father used to extract of me when I was under his care, and which indeed I still thought a duty, though I could not, as it seemed to me, afford time to practice it. A daily London journal comprising satirical essays on social subjects, published by Addison and Steele in 1711 and 1712, The Spectator, and its predecessor, The Tattler, 1709, marked the beginning of periodical literature. When about sixteen years of age, I happened to meet with a book, written by one Tryon, recommending a vegetable diet. I determined to go into it. My brother, being yet unmarried, did not keep house, but boarded himself and his apprentices in another family. My refusing to eat flesh occasioned an inconveniency, and I was frequently chided for my singularity. 
I made myself acquainted with Tyrone's manner of preparing some of his dishes, such as boiling potatoes or rice, making hasty pudding, and a few others, and then proposed to my brother that if he would give me weekly half the money he paid for my board, I would board myself. He instantly agreed to it, and I presently found that I could save half of what he paid me. This was an additional fund for buying books, but I had another advantage in it, my brother and the rest going from the printing-house to their meals, I remained there alone and, dispatching presently my light repast, which often was no more than a biscuit or a slice of bread, a handful of raisins, or a tart from the pastry-cooks, and a glass of water, had the rest of the time till their return for study, in which I made the greatest progress, for that greater clearness of head and quicker apprehension which usually attended temperance in eating and drinking. And now it was being on some occasion made ashamed of my ignorance in figures, which I had twice failed in learning when at school, I took Crocker's book of arithmetic, and went through the whole by myself with great ease. I also read Seller and Shemmy's book of navigation, and became acquainted with the little geometry they contained, but never proceeded farther in that science. And I read about this time Locke on Human Understanding, and The Art of Thinking, by Monsieur Dupont Royal. John Locke, 1632-1704, to 1704, a celebrated English philosopher, founder of the so-called Common Sense School of Philosophers, he drew up a constitution for the colonists of Carolina. A noted society of scholarly and devout men occupying the abbey of Port Royal near Paris, who published learned books among the one here referred to better known as the Port Royal Logic. While I was intended on improving my language, I met with an English grammar, I think it was Greenwood's, at the end of which there were two little sketches of the arts of rhetoric and logic, the latter finishing with a specimen of a dispute with the Socratic method, and soon after I procured Xenophon's memorable things of Socrates, wherein there are many instances of the same method. I was charmed with it, adopted it, dropped my abrupt contradiction and positive argumentation, and put on the humble inquirer and doubter, and being then, from reading Shaftesbury and Collins, become a real doubter in many points of our religious doctrine. I found this method safest for myself, and very embarrassing to those against whom I used it. Therefore I took a delight in it, practiced it continually, and grew very artful and expert in drawing people, even of superior knowledge, into concessions, the consequence of which they did not foresee, entangling them in difficulties out of which they could not extricate themselves, and so obtaining victories that neither myself nor my cause always deserved. I continued this method some few years, but gradually left it, retaining only the habit of expressing myself in terms of modest diffidence, never using, when I advanced anything that may possibly be disputed, the words certainly, undoubtedly, or any others that gave an air of positiveness to an opinion, but rather say, I conceive or apprehend a thing to be so and so it appears to me, or I should think it so or so, for such and such reasons, or I imagine it to be so, or it is so, if I am not mistaken. This habit, I believe, has been of great advantage to me when I have had occasion to inculcate my opinions and persuade men into measures that I have been from time to time engaged in promoting and as the chief ends of conversation are to inform or to be informed to please or to persuade i wish well-meaning sensible men would not lessen their power of doing good by a positive assuming manner that seldom fails to disgust tends to create opposition and to defeat every one of those purposes for which speech was given to us to wit giving or receiving information or pleasure for if you would inform a positive and dogmatical manner, in advancing your sentiments, may provoke contradiction and prevent a candid attention. If you wish information and improvement from the knowledge of others, and yet at the same time express yourself as firmly fixed in your present opinion, modest, sensible men, who do not love disputation, 
will probably leave you undisturbed in the possession of your error and by such a manner you can seldom hope to recommend yourself in pleasing pope says judiciously men should be taught as if you taught them not and things unknown prospered as things forgot further recommending to us to speak though sure with seeming diffidence and he might have coupled with this line that which he has coupled with another i think less properly for want of modesty is want of sense if you ask why less properly i must repeat the lines immodest words admit of no defence for want of modesty is want of sense now is not want of sense wherein a man is so unfortunate as to want it some apology for his want of modesty and would not the lines stand more justly thus immodest words admit but this defence the want of modesty is want of sense this however i submit to better judgments socrates confuted his opponents in an argument by asking questions so skilfully devised that the answers would confirm the questioner's position or show the error of the opponent alexander pope sixteen eighty eight to seventeen forty four the greatest english poet of the first half of the eighteenth century my brother had in seventeen twenty or seventeen twenty one begun to print a newspaper it was the second that appeared in america and was called the new england Courant. the only one before it was the boston news letter i remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking as not likely to succeed one newspaper being in their judgment enough for america at this time seventeen seventy one there were not less than five and twenty he went on however with the undertaking and after having worked in composing the types and printing off the sheets i was employed to carry the papers through the streets to the customers franklin's memory does not serve him correctly here the corinth was really the fifth newspaper established in america although generally called the fourth because the first public occurrences published in boston in sixteen ninety was suppressed after the first issue following is the order in which the other four papers were published boston newsletter seventeen o four boston gazette december twenty first seventeen nineteen the american weekly mercury philadelphia december twenty second seventeen nineteen the new england Courant, seventeen twenty one he had some ingenious men among his friends who amused themselves by writing little pieces for this paper which gained it credit and made it more in demand and these gentlemen often visited us hearing their conversations and their account of the approbation their papers were received with i was excited to try my hand among them but being still a boy and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in his paper if he knew it to be mine i contrived to disguise my hand and writing an anonymous paper i put it in at night under the door of the printing-house it was found in the morning and communicated to his writing friends when they called in as usual they read it commented on it in my hearing and i had the exquisite pleasure of finding it met with their approbation and that their different guesses at the author none were named but men of some character among us for learning and ingenuity i suppose now that i was rather lucky in my judges and that perhaps they were not really so very good ones as i then esteemed them encouraged however by this i wrote and conveyed in the same way to the press several more papers which were equally approved and i kept my secret till my small fund of sense for such performances was pretty well exhausted and then i discovered it when i began to be considered a little more by my brother's acquaintances and in a manner that did not quite please him as he thought probably with reason that it tended to make me too vain and perhaps this might be one occasion of the differences that we began to have about this time though a brother he considered himself as my master and me as his apprentice and accordingly expected the same services from me as he would from another while i thought he deemed me too much in some he required of me who from a brother expected more indulgence our disputes were often brought before our father and i fancy i was either generally in the right or else a better pleader because the judgment was generally in my favour but my brother was passionate 
and had often beaten me, which I took extremely amiss, and, thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, which at length offered in a manner unexpected. One of the pieces in our newspaper on some political point, which I have now forgotten, gave offence to the assembly. He was taken up, censured, and imprisoned for a month by the speaker's warrant. I suppose because he would not discover his author, I too was taken up and examined before the council, but though I did not give them any satisfaction, they contented themselves with admonishing me and dismissed me, considering age, perhaps, as an apprentice, who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, which I resented a good deal, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I made bold to give our rulers some rubs in it, which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light, as a young genius that had a turn for libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was accompanied with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin could no longer print the paper called the New England Corrent. There was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends. What should be done in this case? Some proposed to evade the order by changing the name of the paper, but my brother, seeing inconveniences in that, it was finally concluded on as a better way, to let it be printed for the future under the name of Benjamin Franklin, and to avoid the censure of the assembly that might fall on him as still printing it by his apprentice, the contrivance was that my old indenture should be returned to me with a full discharge on the back of it, to be shown on occasion but to secure to him the benefits of my service i was to sign new indentures for the remainder of the term which were to be kept private a very flimsy scheme it was however it was immediately executed and the paper went on accordingly under my name for several months at length a fresh difference arising between my brother and me i took upon me to assert my freedom presuming that he would not venture to produce the new indentures it was not fair in me to take this advantage and this i therefore reckoned one of the first errata of my life but the unfairness of it weighed little with me when under the impressions of resentment for the blows his passion too often urged him to bestow upon me though he was otherwise not an ill-natured man perhaps i was too saucy and provoking when he found i would leave him he took care to prevent my getting employment in any other printing-house of the town by going round and speaking to every master who accordingly refused to give me work i then thought of going to new york as the nearest place where there was a printer and i was rather inclined to leave boston when i reflected that i had already made myself a little obnoxious to the governing party and from the arbitrary proceedings of the assembly in my brother's case it was likely i might if i stayed soon bring myself into scrapes and farther that my indiscreet disputations about religion began to make me pointed at with horror by good people as an infidel or atheist I determined on the point, but my father now siding with my brother. I was sensible that, if I attempted to go openly, means would be used to prevent me. My friend Collins, therefore, undertook to manage a little for me. He agreed with the captain of a New York sloop for my passage, under the notion of my being a young acquaintance of his. So I sold some of my books to raise a little money, was taken on board privately, and as we had a fair wind, in three days I found myself in New York, near three hundred miles from home a boy of but seventeen without the least recommendation to or knowledge of any person in the place and with very little money in my pocket end of chapter two